All right, well, good morning. Welcome to Church of the Mall. Welcome home. We are so delighted to have you here today with us. We are coming into the season of Thanksgiving, and uh, we are going to start today with uh, some giving of thanks. I want to share a couple things real quick, though, about what is going on in this church, because as many of you know, during this pandemic, uh, we are all fighting to find out where we can be and who we can be with. But I want you to know right now that our space is being utilized by a group from the Village Network uh, I'm sorry, the Village Network uh, group has been using our space two times a month in order to provide a, a counseling opportunity and an opportunity to connect parents who are taking in foster care teenagers and children in our community, which I think is so great. They've been trying to do a lot of this online. It's just not quite the same as meeting in person. And if you have ever tried to raise kids, especially teenagers, you can imagine how helpful this can be to have other parents that you can connect with. But they have asked if we would partner with them and help because due to the coronavirus, they are unable to put out their normal giving trees or kind of like the angel trees, if you remember, where people would put tags of the kids on the Christmas trees in the malls. They've been unable to do that this year due to the coronavirus and they've asked if we would take on the responsibility of 25 kids and the cards look something like this and we're going to invite our community to adopt at least one if not two kids uh, either per person or per family their ages um, 18 months to 18 years it has their age their name their gender it gives a shirt size a pant size a shoe size and then it has only two wants that each child wrote down, and they're under $35, and they're looking for ways in which we can help partner with these families. And as Mariah and I were reading through these cards, I have to tell you, I, it was hard not to cry and shed a tear. Like, here's one. His name is Alex. He's 10 years old. Uh, he wants a skateboard and rechargeable AA batteries. There was another 12-year-old boy that asked for Axe body spray, you know, as he's coming into young adulthood. Here's a young lady who is asking for a robe and house shoes, but she does not want pink, and she's looking for boots. And I just think it's so adorable. These kids have very little. They've been having a really hard time this year, um, especially with this COVID piece, and there's been a lot of mental illness that has been going on throughout our entire community as people feel the depressive aspects of this. And so uh, if that is something that just resonates with you, we would love for you to be a part of this. You can contact us here at Church in the Mall at admin. That's A-D-M-I-N at churchinthemall.com. And uh, we will be able to send you a picture of one of these cards with that child. And you can go out and get those things. And you can bring them back here Sunday mornings, uh, 1045 we open if you want to drop them off here. Or you can come on December 13th. That's a Sunday, right before the final collection day. And we will be here after church from 1 to 3 if you want to do a contactless drop off. We'll be happy to meet you out back behind church in the mall if you come behind Dick's Sporting Goods between... Uh, Big Sandy and Dix and Seacourt will be happy to, to meet you there, collect those items, and then we will actually be meeting with the Village Network that following week and giving these items to them to deliver to the kids. And so I hope this is a way in which you can help us to be a part of bigger things going on in the community. You know, many times we look for things that God is doing in the community and we want to get on board with it. And this is one that truly could use our help and our support. And I believe God is calling us to do it as we are a church that very strongly believes in the foster care system and adoption and helping these children find families of their own. I also want to invite you into this idea of giving uh, during this season here at Church in the Mall as we are continually doing the ministries of this church. What you may not know is groups like that Village Network are looking for places to meet. And so while we are unable to have some of our main church activities and some of our regular operating ministries in the space, we have been able to loan out our space to do more ministry in this community than you could ever imagine. Just this past week, we were contacted by a group out of the Village Network who needed an emergency space to do a coping session with parents and kids. One of the teens in our community uh, committed suicide this past week which is a very heavy, heavy thing to cope with. Not something you can do simply online through Skype or uh, video chat. And so we were able to open our space and provide a time of healing and encouragement for that community, and they were so grateful. But this is what your giving helps to go to. It helps us to provide not only opportunities, but spaces, new spaces for new faces, in which we can invite people into that loving friendship of Christ Jesus, and we too can be a part of the healing in their lives. And so 
when you make your checks out to church in the mall or you do your online giving through PayPal or some of our sources, that's some of the things that you're helping us to build in this community. You're helping us to put hope back into a community that certainly could use a lot of hope right now. And so as we get ready uh, to go into this uh, message today on giving hope, uh, let's open with prayer. And then I'm going to invite Pastor Mariah to come up and share with us uh, the Word of God. And as we do so, we will be enlightened to what God is putting on our hearts and our minds. And my prayer certainly will be that you will have an interesting connection with God that is both personal and joy-filled, that you will have an intimate connection with God during our time today, whether it be in this space or whether it be online. And then we will close with communion. And so for those of you that uh, have not grabbed the elements yet, please feel free to make your way over to the table and grab some communion elements. Those at home, feel free to grab some communion elements of your own as well as we will conclude with that today. So let us bow our heads and just go into a time of prayer as we honor and talk to God and just invite him into our lives and this space and this incredible season of thanksgiving. Father, I know for many of us, thanksgiving is probably not a word that we are really uh, able to embrace right now as many of us are struggling with uh, changing plans and makeshift plans and trying to organize and orchestrate our lives in ways that make sense during a time of such uneasiness and uncertainty. And Father, as things seem to be closing left and right around us, as uh, cities, entire cities are shutting down, Father, we are feeling the weight of all this. And we know that both uh, we want to keep people safe, but also the ramifications that it has on our economy and our lives and the frustrating aspects it can put into just getting normal things like toiletries. But God, we still are thankful. We have our health. We have our lives. Most importantly, we have you and our faith. We have this community. Father, we have hope because of what you've given us through your son, Jesus Christ. And so, Father, even when things get uh, bleak, even when the skies turn dark, I am always reminded that in the midst of all this, you are still there. And that it's these difficult times that really help us to better understand our faith, to grow in our faith, and to know just how loved we are by you. Father, would you come now and enter into this space, into this time, into our lives, both here and at home? And Father, would you come and speak to us through the incredible gift of your Holy Spirit, that we might become one with you today, that your words would resonate deep in our hearts and our minds, and that we would be children of the living God. Come and speak to us in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, the one who has conquered both sin and death, and the one who reigns supreme, true hope in our lives. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Good morning. morning. Welcome to Church in the Mall. Welcome home. Um, As many of you know, um, we have two toddlers at home. And they are trying out independence. (laughs) They want to do things for themselves or things their way. Or let's put it more accurately, they just don't want to do things our way. This is really a hard balance for us um, because it's awesome in the long run. We are raising them to be adults. We are raising them to be people able to function and work and do things for themselves. And it's really crappy in the short term because they insist on doing everything for themselves, which takes longer and often makes a mess and just doesn't fit with my plan at times. Um, Have you ever had a toddler insist on dressing themselves? Yeah, it's real fun. Um, And I have lost, I think, cumulatively days of my life to this exercise because the zipper goes really slow. I do. Me. I want to help you, but okay. Because as I'm thinking, as this toddler is slowly unzipping his jammies, I'm thinking, I could do this so much faster, we'd be done, we'd be out the door. Because I got three of you. And I've got this limited window before the baby goes off again. I ain't got time for this. So I 
I have to keep in mind that I'm raising them to be adults. And so sometimes this comes at a cost to me. Um, and it's frustrating. But again, I have to go back to what I value and what I want for them in, in their lives. Now, there are also the times where they try to assert themselves to do things their way that really is in conflict with our values. Um, it's negative behavior that I want to correct. Or if I think about it, I want to redirect. I want to rechannel it sometimes. You know, like pushing your sibling or hitting them or shaking the baby swing like there's some tiny King Kong. Thank God the baby's not in the swing when they're doing this. But I'm trying to ward off this behavior so in case the baby is ever in the swing when they want to go King Kong. And so many times telling them no or trying to get their attention somewhere else really isn't working. So bring on the timeout. And my husband says this constantly, is that timeouts are no fun. Timeouts are not fun for the child, and they're certainly not fun for us. And sometimes we have to engage in multiple timeouts throughout the day with them. And other times we get really creative with timeouts um, because we'll put toys on timeout. Man, that's effective. That, when we discovered that, that just changed the game entirely. Because the timeout for the toy is for the day. It's not just for a few minutes. And you want to talk about inflicting kind of pain on a child in a way that's meant to redirect their behavior, because I don't want them ramming me with the tr tractor anymore. It's effective. And isn't that the case with us as adults sometimes, is that we sometimes need things to be uncomfortable to change. We need a little bit of, maybe not physical pain, but sometimes that happens when we realize we have to change our diet or, or start engaging in some exercise, that we need to change sometimes to, to get where we want to be. And that needs to be consistent. That's a critical thing with children, but even more so with us as adults, isn't it? And the thing with discipline is that Scripture speaks a lot to it. Um, and this passage, especially from Hebrews, that no discipline seems pleasant at the time. Sometimes it's painful. But later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have trained by it. And I have to think about that sometimes, not only with my children, but also with myself. That discipline is a long game. And the same with my children, it's the same with me. That I often have to reconsider what I'm doing when I encounter some discomfort, when I encounter things that I'm not always just comfortable with. And so our passage today, which comes to us from Matthew, Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46, can make us feel rather uncomfortable especially when we read it and just sort of take it at face value. But with all scripture, we want to sit with it. We want to recognize what comes before it and what comes after it and what happens with it within the whole context of scripture itself. We want to read the whole book. We just don't want to read, you know, page 59. And today's passage speaks to things that we're not often comfortable with, like judgment and punishment but in reality, I think the main purpose of this passage is to make us uncomfortable in order for us to change. See, this passage comes to us in Matthew's Gospel, and it is kind of the final sermon that Matthew records of Jesus's. And so after this passage come Jesus' arrest, his trial, and his crucifixion. And so when we look at this passage and start to realize that it is trying to prompt, trying to promote a heart change, and in that change in our actions and our behavior, I think we start to really start to take a lot of these things home with us. 
And it begins with this really fantastic image of the Son of Man, which is a messianic title for Jesus. And it's about him being the anointed one, the one who has come to save us. And so this, this fantastic image is really Jesus in a throne room, seated on a throne, surrounded by angels and, and in his glory. And so sit with that image for a moment. And before Jesus are all the nations, all the people. You know, we don't encounter throne rooms in our day and age, but to think about something that magnificent. How many people? And as Jesus is seated there, he begins to separate people. And there's a, there's a metaphor of, of the way a shepherd would separate the goats from the sheep. Those on his right, the sheep, and those on his left, the goats. And there's really nothing, you know, terribly significant about being sheep or goats so much, especially in ancient times. Both were valued. But it's simply just kind of, this is kind of how Jesus is doing it, similar to a shepherd, that he would separate them. And then it talks about how he as king will start to pronounce judgment. And so looking at those to his right, he says this to them, there are good things for you. Welcome. This is your inheritance. And they're like, great, this is wonderful. And Jesus starts to commend them for what they have done. You've clothed me when I was naked. You gave me food when I was hungry. You welcomed me in when I was a stranger. And this is where it gets a little confusing for the people on the right. When, when did we see you like this, Jesus? Like, we don't remember this. Glad we did it, but I don't remember it. And the king says to them, truly I tell you, whatever you did for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Because we all recognize, of course you treat the king or the, let's put it in our modern day terms, the CEO, you treat them well. But a stranger? someone you really don't know or someone who certainly doesn't look like they have anything to offer you, someone poor, someone hungry, someone maybe with a sign saying, hungry, please help. Can't do those people with that sign, those people standing on the corner, they can't do anything for you. So we kind of get the logic of why would you help them they can't really repay your kindness. But this is what happened. That these people on the right of Jesus, they saw someone in need and they met that need. And so for that, they're being rewarded. They're being rewarded with an inheritance from the Father and eternal life. And then there are those on the left. And the king calls them out for their indifference. And they are promised terrible things and eternal punishment. And again, they ask, when did we see you like this? Why, when did we ignore you, Jesus, when you were hungry, when you were naked, when you were the stranger? And again, the king repeats to them almost the same thing, except there's an important not. I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. See, when we think about this image, and it's, it's a metaphor, it's an analogy, it's, it's an image for us to kind of understand a truth that Jesus is trying to teach, is that the group to the right 
our disciples. Not simply by name, but because they have followed Jesus' example. And that's truly what it is to be a disciple, is to follow Jesus. And they have followed his example of compassion and obedience to the will of the Father. Now, these acts of mercy, as they're described in this passage, hear me on this. They are not the means to an end. They are not the means to salvation. But they are expressions of experiencing salvation. They are expressions of knowing God's love. Now, we don't commit to actions of mercy and compassion to receive salvation. We commit to these actions because we're living out our salvation. We're living out a life of gratitude in which we are sharing the compassion and mercy we have received from God with others. And so disciples will see Jesus in everyone that they encounter. Because you will never look into the eyes of someone that God does not love. You will never look into the eyes of someone that God does not love. And so this compassion that Jesus is teaching on in this passage has no other motive than simply meeting a need. And that this compassion should come from our identity that is shaped by God and his love. And at the end of everything, we're going to be held accountable to how we responded to God and his love. And if you think about it, you think about your own life when you have seen somebody that you go, they know God, they know Jesus. Jesus just seems to ooze out of them that they are a strong witness to the gospel because they live a life of mercy and compassion. Because Jesus' words to us earlier in Matthew is this command to love God and love others. And these commands are tied together because we can't separate our relationship with God from our relationship with people. Because the best way to love God is to love others. And the best way to love others is to love God. So when we experience the compassion of God, we have the opportunity to become a medium or a vehicle of that compassion that we've received. We get the opportunity to share it with others. And often when we engage in that compassion, when we engage in sharing, we encounter God again. It's an interesting cycle to think about the way it works. Because for those of us in Christ, the origin and recipient of every action is Christ himself. Whether that is good, whether that's negative, now we can draw a little too heavily on the judgment in this passage and ignore the opportunity to, to think about compassion. Because I think at the end of this, this is telling us that our actions, they matter. And I'll be honest, I don't want my negative actions to count for anything. I just want them to be forgotten. But I'll tell you, when I do something good, I want it to count. I want it to count for something. I want someone to notice, even if it's just God, and especially if it's God. So what this passage is telling us is that our actions matter to God. What we do in this life has meaning and matter greatly to God. And so when we read something like this, we may get a little uncomfortable. We may go, oh, what side would I be on? And after an especially bad day, you might go, I know what side I'm on. But at the end of it, it's, 
it's meant to prompt us to, to think, how can I be more compassionate? I have a responsibility to others because of God's love. And so when we think about what we want to do in response, when we read scripture, we want to, to kind of understand what it means and then what it means for our lives. And often we experience what's called conviction. And conviction is really that, that uncomfortable feeling, or sometimes it's even a strong feeling like, I have to do something. I can't just sit still anymore. This conviction is often what calls us to repentance. And that's a big churchy word at times, but really it, repentance is about turning to God or even aligning what we're doing, making sure that what we are doing is in alignment with God and his will. And I'll be honest, this passage for me is, is particularly convicting. That because of all that's going on, because of all the stuff that we are so tired of talking about, my focus is very selfish. Um, I'm focused a lot on what I've lost, what I'm looking forward to experiencing again. I'm looking at my Thanksgiving and going, well, that's not the way I want it. And that really distracts me from being aware of others. Because when I read this passage, I'm struck by the fact that both those on the right and those on the left are confused about where Jesus was. Where were you? When were you there? They didn't notice him. Now, the ones on the right did notice the stranger, did notice those who were in need, and they acted on that. And they're commended for it. They're rewarded for it. And when I am too aware of myself, I can't pay attention to those around me. I can't see the need. I can't see the stranger that's right in front of me. And so I need to refocus my attention. I need to see what I do have. And I also have to recognize that what I have is meant to be shared. That the grace and the peace that God has offered me is something that I am to share with others. That in sharing it, I lose nothing. In fact, I gain. Because in sharing it, I encounter God all the more. I get to see how God will use me, how God will work through me. And that is powerful, and that is healing, especially in the midst of loss and hurt. And so I want to share with you today something that I'm excited that we're going to be doing as a church. Because I think that, one, it is incredibly powerful. It's something I'm looking forward to doing. And it's something I think that will take our focus on what we don't have and focus instead on what we have to share. See, as we often approach Christmas, we prepare, don't we? We start to decorate, or at least I do. I start to decorate. I send out cards. I start to shop for gifts. And I love that. I love to give gifts. And I host our Christmas party at my fam for my family. And this year, that's going to look a lot different. We're going to have to make some changes. And I could be really disappointed in it, and, and part of me is. I'm bummed. But as John and I were preparing to get ready for Christmas, as we started to talk about things, you know, we, we recognize that in our family situation right now, um, his hours have been cut. And, and so things are a little tight financially. But we're able to make it. We're actually in a great place. And we recognize that because his hours have been cut, his company is able to stay afloat and keep more people employed. And that's a good thing. But it's forced us to kind of look at our normal Christmas list and knowing that we're not going to be seeing as many people and that some others in our circle are probably in the same circumstance, that we've decided to kind of dial back our gift giving. Um, and we've had some conversations, and I was really worried about having some of them. I was like, oh, I'm just, it's embarrassing, it's awkward. And then when I had them, I found this strange joy in it because the way that the people on the other end of the phone responded. I was having a conversation with a friend who 
saying, oh, we want to do something for you. And John and I said, well, wait. I need to let you know what our plans are for Christmas. That we're kind of dialing back on gifts. And she said, that sounds wonderful. I'd love to join you in it. So what I was expecting to be awkward and embarrassing ended up being a moment in which we could talk about what we really value in this season. And she said, I still want to talk to you about what we want to do for you. And at some point, we'd love to offer you some babysitting. And I said, oh, I'll take that. Um, (laughs) But in dialing it back a little bit financially, we've still said, what are the things that we want to commit to? One of the things we still want to be part of in this, this world. And, and we didn't want to dial back our generosity. And so one of the things, like Kevin talked about earlier, we, we've committed to picking up two of these, these foster kids' Christmases. Um, it's just important to us. We know how critical it is at this time of, of year, especially for those kids who may not get to see their parents. Um, who may be in in homes that are not their own, but who are trying to do the best by them, um, that, you know, this could be a little joy in their life. You know, know, getting their LOL doll may just make their Christmas. So we committed to that. But then there's this second piece that I want to tell you about today that we're doing at Church in the Mall for this month of Christmas, is that we are looking at... um, a little bit different. Often at Christmas time, we start to prepare with gifts. And this year, we're doing something we're calling the 24 Days of Christmas. And how it works is that on December 1st, you take a box. And you start to fill that box each day with a different item. That on Christmas Eve, you will have 24 items that you will donate to folks in need. Now, we've prepared a list, so each day you have an item to put in your box, and those items support places like the Food Pantry Network of Licking County, the Boys and Girls Club, Vertical 196, our local outreach to the homeless, as well as our support for the Susanna Wesley School in Annapra, Mexico. There is incredible need in our community. And so when I read a passage like this that really makes me think, I I need to to think about others. I need to look for ways that I can offer mercy and compassion in my community. This this is an opportunity to do so. See, these organizations um, are already doing incredible work, and they are meeting new needs every day, that their need this year has gone up, which is understandable. I'll give you an example, the Food Pantry Network in our community, they measure kind of what they do by pounds, how many pounds of food that they are giving out. Well, last October, October 2019, they gave out about 391,000 pounds of food just in the month of October. This October, they have given out 573 thousand pounds of food. That is an increase from one October to the next of 182,000 pounds of food. That tells you what's going on. And they're trying to meet needs in creative ways because they're not giving out as frequently, but they're actually giving out more. So they're trying to give folks more so they don't have to come in as much to create less contact. And so this Christmas, we want to be part of that good work, as well as the good work other organizations are doing to meet needs in our community. And that's why we're doing these 24 days of Christmas. So each day in December, we have an opportunity to engage in caring for the stranger, for people we will never meet. We hope that this is something, one, that you will do this as a family, but also maybe invite your neighbors into it. Because it's a really simple thing, and yet it can be so powerful. See, I'm kind of seeing this, of of talking this up with friends and family and neighbors and saying, we're going to be doing this as my church. If I put a box on my doorstep and gave you a list of those items, would you want to help throw some things in the box? They don't have to see me, they don't have to touch me, but they get to be a part of the good that's going on. 
you may have people who are like, well, I could just send you some, some dollars for this, and that would be awesome as well. So we are thinking that this is an opportunity, one, for us to do this as individuals, but also then to share in the good stuff, that we invite others into doing good in our community. And so when your box is filled, you get to bring it to church in the mall, and we'll donate those things to those charities to help others. Now, I know that some of you are going, well, 24 things is a lot of things. It is. I did a quick and dirty math on it, and it's about, you know, $75 to fill the box. Now, that's me just going through, not looking for sale items. Some of you are way better bargain shoppers than I am. Um, and that also includes a $20 gift to the Susanna Wesley School in Annapra, which is really, it's, they're encountering and dealing with this pandemic just as we are, if not more so, because they already started out in poverty. And so we want to be part of a global effort as well. And I love the fact that we are doing things locally. We are doing things for people who have need with hunger. We are doing things for children. We are doing things for the homeless. And we are doing things on a global level. Allowing us to see the stranger everywhere. And know that when we do this, that we are extending the love that we have received from Christ. And so thinking about this, as an opportunity each day in December leading up to Christmas Eve. I'm inviting you to consider how that your witness to the gospel is strongest when you engage in acts of compassion and mercy. And for those of you who are going, I can't do all 24, do what you can. Or invite others into it with you and say, you know, the five of us, we could do this together. Don't get caught up in doing it perfectly. Get caught up in doing it with great joy and hope. Because at the end of it, what we do for them, we do for Christ. What you do for the least of these, you have done for me. And when I think about Christmas in light of this, I get excited. I get excited about being able to not focus on so much of what I don't have, but focusing on what I do have to share. Now, for those of you who are with us in person today, there's a list on your table. You're welcome to take that, pray over it, consider it. For those of you who are joining us online, we'll be sharing that list this week in our newsletter. So if you're not already on our e-newsletter, you'll want to sign up for that, and we'll put that link in our comments here today. Or send us a direct message, and we'll email you back the list itself. I hope that you'll join us in this. Join us in a simple act each day. It's probably going to take about five to ten minutes of your time at most each day. To take your box... Really simple. I'm reusing, recycling my Amazon box here. And each day taking an item that can be an object of hope for another person and I'm placing it in here. It's as simple as that. Now some of you may say, you know, I could reuse something else like a, a laundry basket. Great. Simply engage in the process every day. And in this maybe see I have this to give. I have more than I realize to share with others. And in this, I get to give hope every day. This Christmas, we want to be that witness of joy and hope so that we truly see Jesus in everyone that we encounter. Amen. Now, as we turn to communion, to take time where we pause and we receive juice and bread, we once again go to the table to receive from Jesus, to take sustenance from him in order that we can share with others. 
And so if you're with us at home, gather your, your elements, those of you with us. Gather what you have as we partake together. And I love this image that we have in Scripture, that we have of Jesus sitting down with this meal with his friends, his closest, that they partake of all together, that they tear the bread, they take of the same cup, recognizing that they all are in this together. And so as Jesus took the cup, gave thanks for it, blessed it, and shared it with his disciples, encouraging them take, receive, that he does this for the forgiveness of sins, to understand and know that God has done this all out of great love. I encourage you now to take of your juice, to receive that which was shed for us, and to be shared with all of humanity. And the bread, symbolizing his body, to be broken. Have you ever taken bread and broken it like this? The physical act of it is sometimes a reminder to me that Christ was broken for us. And that as we go into Christmas, a a season in which we reflect on God with us, that we have an opportunity to know that in his brokenness, we are made whole. So take of your bread, your crackers, whatever. Taste and see that God is good. Friends, I pray that this week, and as you prepare for Thanksgiving in whatever format that's going to take for you, that you give thanks for what you have, for what you're looking forward to, but also what you have to share. And that in this, you know that everyone that you encounter is loved by God. And so when you look at them, I hope that you see Jesus. I hope that when you look in their eyes, you see Jesus. And as we head for December, as we prepare for Christmas, that we engage in knowing that we are offered the opportunity to share that which we have received, to share that mercy and that compassion with all. I pray this for each of us, for all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week, everyone.